Well, that was great. Got to shake out all the shivers now. Wonderful. Wow. <clears throat> all right. A couple of things to mention as we get going here. Uh, first of all, Pastor Steve already mentioned that uh, if you've been a part of a small group that's been a part of a sermon series, or if you want to be a part of one, this is the time to do that again. We do it in the spring and in the fall. We push it a little more in the spring, trying to encourage you, but we're trying to start to make this available in the fall series as well. So if you've got that group, do I have a problem? Yeah, your mic's not over here. Oh. There we go. Luckily, I'm loud, right? Yeah, that bothers Alicia sometimes when I talk like that at home, yeah. All right, is that better? I'm back online. Hi, everybody. Yeah. All right, good. So we're talking about groups, and we've got, uh, we've prepared studies for the different small groups, and group together this week, starts this week, and the study will be about the church of Ephesus. It'll all make more sense when we get to the end today. But the studies are available on the church website. Pastor dolan has got them there, as well as there are some hard copies in the West Lobby over here uh, on the desk at a uh, welcome station desk there. So if you want to grab one of those on your way out, it's really easy. All you got to do is get people together. You sit around, you read through the questions, you read the text, and just share with each other. It's really, a, it's as much about the shared experience as it is about necessarily getting all the right answers. Be a part of that. And plus then that gives you a really big boost for next Sabbath when we talk about that particular subject. So I hope a lot of you will participate in that. I know everyone that does will not be sorry. So I hope you'll do that. Second thing is, you may have noticed today when you came in, there's a large number of banners out there uh, talking about 150 years of Adventist health ministry. It was about 150 years ago that the Adventist church, uh, through some visions to Ellen White and through some other folks as well, came to the conviction that it's not enough for us just to address the spiritual reality of people. A person is a whole reality, body, mind, and spirit, and, and we've got to address all the elements of a person's reality uh, for them to really truly prosper. And uh, so the Adventist Church got involved in health ministries 150 years ago. And uh, to mark that particular uh, time that's gone by since the beginning of this, a Florida Hospital is sponsoring a special Sabbath service two weeks from today. Now, we've talked about this before, but I want to remind you of it again, September 17. We're going to do our services a little different that, way, that day. We won't have first service on the 17th, and we're going to do a pause in this series that we're doing on that date. Um, but at Calvary Assembly, which is a large uh, auditorium, just a little ways down off of Interstate 4, you've probably seen it many times, is where the gathering will be. There'll be a Sabbath morning service and also a Sabbath afternoon service. This is going to be a really neat event. Dan Jackson, the division president, is here and he will be the speaker, and there will be a lot of really neat things going on. So I want to encourage many of you to be there that day. As many of you as, uh, as want to be a part of that, go to that event, be there on the 17th, and uh, you will be glad you did. That'll be a neat event. So we are going to have our uh, children's Sabbath schools. Pastor Barb checked around, and there were enough that were going to be here that wanted to do the Sabbath schools of the leaders. So we will have our children's Sabbath schools those days, but no first service that day. Just the bridge and third, and Pastor Steve will speak here at third on that day. So look for that two weeks from now, uh, a special heritage event coming up. All right. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask now that your spirit will come and speak to us in ways that we can understand. We want ears that hear, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. It is the first part of the first verse of that most enigmatic book of the Bible. 
And already, there's confusion. Did you spot it? Ah, well, you will in a second. There's a Bible in front of you. Grab that Bible out of the pew right there in front of you. What I'm reading to you is the latest edition of the New International Version. Now, the Bible right in front of you is also a New International Version. But open that up to Revelation chapter. Does that Bible read the revelation from Jesus Christ? Does it? What does it say? It says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, my. We don't even have the same words in the same translations anymore. What in the world is that? Is it a revelation from Jesus Christ? Or is it a revelation about Jesus Christ? I suppose you could get either of those from the word, the revelation of Jesus Christ. You could go either way with that, couldn't you? Well, why is that an issue? I'm going to put some words up here in a second, and you're going to see immediately why it's an issue. Put put those Greek words up there. Now you get it, right? Yeah, it all comes clear. No, these are actually the first three words of the book we call Revelation in Greek. And what it says is, Apocalypsis Jesu Christu. All right, Jesu Christu. I think you know what that is. We have enough Spanish left over around here to have a clue about that. That's Jesus Christ. And you've probably heard this book called The Apocalypse, right? Well, that's from that word apocalypsis the first word in the book. Now that word has come to mean all kinds of scary things in our day. But here's what's funny about it. Originally that word itself is, in its original context, is actually a rather harmless word. You see, apocalypsis, it's a compound word. It comes from apu, meaning from or away from, and calypto, meaning lid, or cover. So you put those together, apocalypto means to uncover, or remove the lid, or reveal. So an example of this, when you get home after church today and you're walking around and there's a really good smell kitchen, you might wander into the kitchen over to the stove and apocalypto that pan to see what's going on inside there. It's not so scary when you say it that way, is it? That's what it means to take the cover off, to reveal. It's kind of funny how such a benign has come in our day to carry such fearful baggage to the extent that Hollywood uses it in movie titles to suggest something frightening and supernatural. X-Men Apocalypse. It's not as scary if you say, X-Men, take the lid off. It kind of loses it, doesn't it? Or some years ago, Apocalypse Now. Take the lid off now. No, it's not there. But the truth is, we've done that with the English word revelation as well, or at least we have whenever we apply that word to this last book of the Bible that was penned by the beloved disciple John. But here's my question for you. Is that how it's supposed to be? Are we, when we hear revelation or apocalypse, are we bringing the right context with us? Are we bringing the right perceptions with us? Are we bringing the right emotions with us when we come to consider this? What is this last book of the Bible really all about? Now this brings us back to the issues around the interpretation of the very first words. Is it the apocalypse of Jesus or the apocalypse from Jesus? Well, that's the point. It doesn't actually say. It just says apocalypse Jesu Christu, uncovering Jesus Christ. So is it a revealing of Jesus Christ or is it a revealing from Jesus? All right. The best answer I can give you is yes, that's exactly what it is. It is from him, and it is about him. Which brings us to what I believe is the first very important point of this new series that we're starting today. If your study of Revelation is not giving you a clearer picture of Jesus, you aren't doing it right. Now, I'm not denying that there aren't fantastic images and fearful sights, but these become for you a distraction 
The focus must remain on the hero who appears and reappears from the beginning to the end of the book. The one whose victory this Bible book reveals. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So we begin our fall series A, and it will run through the second Sabbath of November, except as we mentioned for September 17 in a couple weeks. And we've named this series Candles. I'll say a little more about that uh, in a little bit, but the focus for this series will be on Revelation chapters one through five. We're gonna be spending seven of those 10 weeks though, just on chapters two and three, the descriptions and prescriptions for seven churches. Now there's two things as we get into this that I want you to understand about these seven churches. The first thing I want you to understand is this. These churches are literal, actual places with the circumstances that John is describing. The first thing you need to know is these places existed. There was an Ephesus and a Smyrna and a Pergamum and a Thyatira and a Sardis and a Philadelphia and a Laodicea and they had Christians in them. So the very first thing you need to understand about these messages to churches is that they are to real people like you and I. And these messages are valid to those churches and those people. But the second thing I want you to understand is that these churches are also symbolic. They're representative as a group of all churches in their day and also churches down to our day. In our day, you're gonna find churches just like these. So this is the key to how we're gonna consider these churches going forward. First, as we consider them, we're gonna seek to understand them as literal churches with real people, not unlike us. That'll make it real for us. And then we're going to do two other things. Then we're going to look for symbolic lessons that we can understand conceptually. But we're also going to look for practical lessons that we can apply to our personal lives and also apply to our church life. We'll incorporate a couple of neat features each week. I don't know if it's when I read verse 3, Revelation 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. That's an interesting thing for the Bible to say, isn't it? Blessed is the one who reads it aloud, and blessed are those who hear. You get the sense that, yes, it's not wrong to go off and read this by yourself, but the primary way this book was intended to be read was together with someone reading and others listening. And I have to wonder, wouldn't we perhaps avoid some of the craziness we get in this book if everybody wasn't all the time running off by themselves and reading it all alone, and we spent a little more time reading it together and bouncing our crazy the ideas off of each other instead of running wild in our own imaginations. Sometimes the church can help us from making some pretty bad mistakes. The book of Revelation was meant to be read aloud and heard, and this verse promises blessings when it's read and when it's heard. And so that's exactly what we're going to do every week. When it comes time for the sermon, someone come out and recite or read aloud the entire passage for that week. And we, now this is, this is the other part, listen to this, I'm going to be part of this. We will quietly listen and hear. Okay, because sometimes when someone talks, you're not sure you understand or you're not sure that you're interested, it just sounds like blah, 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 right? 
The blessing doesn't come to the one who sits and it sounds like blah, blah, blah. The blessing comes to the one who listens. And so we're going to do that. And while we do that, we're going to claim the promise blessing. We're going to claim the promise in this verse that blessing comes to the one who reads and to those who hear. This is an overlap here with our last series, our believing series. Do you remember when we talked about that phrase that Jesus would say sometimes, he who has ear, let him hear? Every now and then Jesus would say that at the end of a teaching or something. You're going to hear that phrase again because that phrase happens in every single one of these churches in every message to them. Revelation is the voice of Jesus to us. It's a revelation from him and a revelation about him. And do you remember the thing with the sheep? If we are his sheep, we will recognize his voice and we will follow. So we're going to do a recitation and we're going to practice each week hearing the message of Jesus to us in that recitation. But there's another thing we're going to do and that's a song. The short song that we're going to sing each week associated with the message to each church. This is a song that's going to remind us that we need to listen to the voice of Jesus. So we're going to teach the song today. We're actually going to expose you to it. You're going to get a chance to practice. Today's just practice. It gets real next. We'll do the recitation, then the song, and then we'll do the sermon. So this week is practice. You want to get good at it this week, so uh, please... If you don't mind, that would be lovely. Sing it again together. Sing it with me. You guys on your own this time. each week, only the words in the middle will change. The beginning and the end will always be the same, but those words that we sang in the middle are a part of the specific message to the church at Ephesus. So in the second week, when we're the, well, it'll be the third week of the series, but when we're talking about Smyrna, there'll be different words there because the prescriptions to each church are different based on the reality that's taking place there. And the last part will always be the same, and then there'll be different words in the middle. So, all right. That sounded good. They're going to do great. All right, I'll tell you a little bit more about that song as we go along, but uh, that's a really neat song. I like it. All right. 
So, here we go. Why all this fuss about seven churches? Well, I want to notice the next part of chapter 1 of Revelation. Revelation 1, verse 4. The next section says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. All right, we're talking about this book, the the Apocalypse, the the Revelation. It is to the seven churches that this book is sent. Now, these seven churches that you see listed here are literal. They're real. Those are real places that existed in what was called the province of Asia in those days. Right now, it would be in the, the country of Turkey. They literally were there, but they also are representative of the other churches. The point of this being that this book is written for the church and sent to the church and intended to be understood by the churches. And that goes from beginning to end. It's from Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. At the end, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for who? The churches. All the way at the end, we're referencing all the way back to the beginning, talking about these churches again. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So, who is this book for? It's for the churches, both literally and figuratively. We're included in that. Who is this book from and who is this book about from beginning to end? So from the beginning to the end, the intent is clear. This revelation of Jesus Christ is for the churches, and if we have ears that hear, then we are the churches. Now, we won't get into any of the specific messages to the churches, but we will get to the vision that John sees at the very beginning that is the key to understanding the messages to the churches and to addressing the issues that each of the churches face. We'll get to that in a moment, but let's continue our reading. Verse 4, John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ. All right, I want to, I want to stop right there for a second. Do you see what just happened there? Who did we address? We addressed to him who is and who was and who is to come and the seven spirits before his throne and Jesus Christ. Does that sound like a group you've heard of before? Kind of like Father, Spirit, Son. Okay, so there's a three right. But I want you to watch what happens next. And from Jesus Christ, verse 5, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, we're getting a clue here. We've addressed Father, Spirit, and Son, but now we're expanding on because this book is primarily about him. And we're focusing here on three identities that identify him. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus is the faithful witness. He came from, he lived in our flesh. He faithfully did all that God called and required. And he's the witness of the reality of God. He's the firstborn from the dead. Now, is Jesus the first ever recorded person resurrected? No, we know that's not true. So it can't mean that exactly, but, but here's what we need to understand in that statement, the firstborn from the dead. Do you remember how we've talked about this before, how all of Christianity is built and centered around Jesus Christ? And it's centered around that confession, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, his identity. And when we understand who Jesus was, then we bridge back from there and we can understand the creation. And we bridge forward from there and we can understand when Jesus comes again. It's all centered there in him. The faith begins with our faith in Jesus. Our eternal life begins in the reality of Jesus' eternal life. And it was not until he had died and rose again that, in fact, death had been defeated. 
And any resurrection that took place before that was either temporary or provisional until Jesus himself overcame death. Therefore, he is truly the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. But it goes on. Then it says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. There's another three there. You see, numbers like three and seven and twelve are real important in the book of Revelation. These next three are defining actions that Jesus has done. He loves us. He freed us from our sins by his blood, and he made us into a kingdom and into priests to serve his God and Father. So just initial part, just in this initial reading, are you already beginning to see a clearer picture of Jesus? Well, hang on, because the picture is about to become overwhelming, or at least it was for John. It becomes kind of a fascinating little text in poetic form that calls to mind at least two Old Testament passages. I'll give you those passages. You may want to write them down, but here's what it says. Verse 7, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Now there's an allusion here to Daniel chapter 7. It's kind of an interesting allusion because the references are not necessarily perfectly aligned in how we would interpret them, but the language is very much aligned. And there's also a, re- a, a reference to Zechariah chapter 12. You may want to go there and read that one because I'll bet you don't know that one off the top of your head. Zechariah chapter 12, especially the last part, we actually have an interesting little understanding that's developed from this passage and another about the reality of who will be a part of special resurrection just before Jesus comes. But that's not for today. You can look at that. It's all very interesting. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So let's review so far. We've got a message written by John. It's a message that is a revelation, an uncovering, a revealing. It's from and it's about Jesus. It's given by God through Jesus to a messenger or an angel, then on to John who writes it down. It is addressed, if you will, to the seven churches in the province of Asia in a literal sense but also addressed to us in a figurative sense. We don't have any more time to spend on that today, so let's press on. Verse 9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, there's some interesting words here that I want you to notice How many of you were here back in the year 2012? We did the series on the three angels. Were you here then? Do you remember that? That's some of you, quite a few of you. Do you remember we spent a lot of time uh, for a while during that series talking about a particular word? It was a Greek word. Do you remember it? Hupomone. Do you remember that word? We talked about hupomone. It shows up in Revelation 14, verse 12, which is a very important text to the Adventist church that says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And we talked about that word patience. That word is hupomone. It means endurance. It means being on for a long time. Well, isn't it interesting? You go all the way back to the beginning here, and John is writing in chapter 1, and he says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and hupomone patient endurance. You see, patient endurance is an important part of being the church. John says, I'm with you. I get it. There's suffering, but there's kingdom. We've got to hang on. Patient endurance. 
So I guess what I would say to you is, he who has an ear, she who has an ear, let them hear. Patient endurance will be required in your faith walk. So hang on. Don't give up when it gets tough. Verse 10, on the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We keep going, verse 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. If we were reading the King James Version, it would be seven golden candlesticks. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. All right. That was a pretty overwhelming description. And if you're not a person, that probably just blew right by you as a lot of words. But it's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to see it. And John turned around when he heard the voice and saw Jesus standing in the midst of the candlesticks, the points of light, the candles. And regarding what his eyes saw when he turned, well, where do we even start? First of all, these images that John sees when he looks at Jesus are steeped deep in Old Testament imagery. These are viewed prophets that's seen as well. There's parallelism with Daniel chapter 10. There's significant overlap with what Ezekiel sees in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 8. And from an impact perspective, very much what Isaiah experienced in Isaiah chapter 6. But all of these connections here are part of the point. You see, we're taking the lid off. We're revealing Jesus for who he is. And it's staggering when you finally understand who Jesus really is. I want you to pause for a moment here and reflect. This is being written by John, the beloved disciple, who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and ate with Jesus and sojourned with him. In fact, he was so close with Jesus that do you remember the story of the Last Supper when they're at the table? It says that John leaned over against Jesus and asked him a question. They're close. But here's the thing, even if you're Jesus' best friend, when you see him in the fullness of his glory, there's only one proper response. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This is a moment that Daniel understood. Daniel 10, verse 8. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Ezekiel knows it. Ezekiel 1, verse 28. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. And Isaiah gives voice to this moment. Isaiah 6, verse 5. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I sometimes wonder, lost our sense of awe in the presence of Jesus? Have we so humanized him into our image that we no longer feel the awe when he walks amongst the candlesticks? There's no time to fully unpack all of these descriptions of Jesus. 
We will, though, as we consider the churches, for as you'll see, these attributes of Jesus are the cures for the problems that the churches have. So we can't unpack, but chapter 1 has a few more words to add to this. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. And this is where we have to end today. But then where could we go that would be more appropriate than this? On our faces, before the Jesus who receives us with grace and peace and hope and the promise of eternal life. Do you ever let your mind go to the greatness of Jesus? Do you ever think about him as a faith shining brilliantly and glowing like bronze from the fire and eyes that are bright and you gotta love the double-edged sword that comes out of his mouth boy that would get your attention wouldn't it but yet despite this surpassed glorious vision that puts John on his face the words of Jesus are always comfort do not be afraid I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive ever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. To bring us to this vision of Jesus is the purpose of the Apocalypsis Jesu Christu, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what this book is about, that we would see Jesus as the conquering hero and Savior that he is. And no other book could wrap up the Old Testament and wrap up the New Testament into a better final conclusion of it all. Jesus is our tender shepherd. He calls and we follow, but Jesus is also the great and mighty king he appears in his glory and we fall in worship that's the Jesus we want to see the Jesus that walks amongst the candlesticks the Jesus of great let's pray Father in heaven, we're asking for a revelation, for an apocalypsis, for a taking off of the cover. Lord, we want to see Jesus in all his glory. Send your spirit, Lord. Give us ears that hear. And as we explore these messages to the churches, speak to our hearts. Speak to our corporate heart. May we be faithful to this Jesus who is our conquering King. In his name we pray. Amen.